Good morning. I call today's subcommittee on investigations, oversight, and regulations hearing to order. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us. The importance of small businesses in supporting the United States economy cannot be overstated. With 29.6 million small businesses employing 47.8% of the workforce, small business success is essential to the economic well-being of both individual communities throughout the country as well as our nation overall. While there are many factors that contribute to the success of a small business, one factor that is often overlooked is the community small business relationship. This relationship is complex and reciprocal, requiring effort and support from both the community and the small businesses to achieve mutual success. Today's hearing will focus on understanding the community small business relationship, the resources currently available to foster this important relationship, and areas for resource expansion in the future. When we are talking about the community small business relationship, all sources of community are important. Some of the most Business-centric communities are found within the Small Business Administration, or SBA, entrepreneurial development, pro development programs. My home state of Mississippi is fortunate to have a Women's Business Center, a Veterans Business Outreach Center, or VBOC, the multiple score chapters, and small business development centers. These entrepreneurial development communities, along with many others, have been integral to the success of Mississippi's 252,000 small businesses. Why are these and other communities so important? Statistically, a small business owner who is involved in a community has the support of the community and is significantly more likely to receive patronage, promotion, assistance, and advice from that community. Many small business owners rely on communities, such as SBA's entrepreneurial development programs, to offer them the knowledge and resources they need to be successful. Conversely, many communities rely on the success of small businesses to survive and thrive. A successful small business provides 3.7 times more direct local economic benefit than a large non-local business. Clearly, understanding and fostering this relationship is vital not only to the small businesses and communities involved, but to the economic well-being of our nation. Our witnesses today will speak to their experiences regarding the community small business relationship, both in terms of the communities found in the SBA's entrepreneurial development programs, as well as those found elsewhere. I look forward to hearing their stories and their advice on what Congress can do better to provide small businesses and communities with the resources they need to succeed. I now yield to the ranking member, Ms. Adams, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all of the witnesses for being here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this uh, important meeting regarding the SBA resources available in our communities. The SBA administers a portfolio of entrepreneurial development programs, including small business development centers, women's business centers, the, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, or SCORE, and veterans business outreach programs. These initiatives provide aspiring entrepreneurs and existing businesses with invaluable counseling, training, technical assistance, and mentorship. This hearing gives us the opportunity to celebrate the role of SBA resources partners in the diverse ways uh, they serve our country and learn more about how they tailor their offerings to their unique communities. Whether it's uh, help with creating a business plan, navigating the procurement process, marketing a new product, or identifying international trade opportunities, the SBA's entrepreneurial development programs provide an array of services uh, to help small firms navigate regulatory obstacles, grow, and thrive. Entrepreneurs therefore significantly benefit from having uh, tools to identify fiscally planned for and maintain critical business improvements. Small business owners located throughout the country, including in underserved rural and uh, inner city communities, also benefit from accessible, affordable technical assistance. This reduces their isolation from buyers and other businesses. In addition to outreach, hands-on counseling is critical for businesses to obtain information pertinent to uh, their local market and capacities. This is why the SBA Entrepreneurial Development Programs are so critical to our local communities. As an example, the agency's network of small business development centers uh, is one such program. Uh, they operate in nearly 1,000 locations across the country, located at colleges, universities, 
chambers of commerce and local economic development corporations, allowing them to harness local community resources. In a single year, this initiative has helped more than 17,000 entrepreneurs launch new businesses, advise nearly 200,000 clients, uh, providing training sessions for over 260,000 attendees, and help clients obtain over $5 billion in financing. Clearly, uh, this program is vital. It's a vital part of our nation's entrepreneurial ecosystem. The SBA has also undertaken efforts to connect younger entrepreneurs with more experienced businessmen and women throughout the SCORE program, an expansive network of entrepreneurs, business leaders, and executives who volunteer as mentors to small firms both in person and online. SCORE has become one of the federal government's largest volunteer business advisor and mentoring programs with over 11,000 business professionals at over 320 chapters nationwide. By offering advice from real work pr professionals, SCORE is helping many business owners uh, within all categories of the entrepreneurial community. Small businesses are as diverse as our nation and the SBA as entrepreneurial development initiatives target at specific demographic groups. Women Business Centers, or WBCs, are a critical initiative for female entrepreneurs. Uh, WBCs provide in-depth counseling, training, and mentoring to small firms, resulting in substantial economic impact as measured by successful business startups, job creation and retention, and increased company revenues. Women business owners have used this program to develop business plans, obtain financing, and expand their operations. As more women turn to entrepreneurship as a career path, it's critical this initiative remain in place to close those gaps. And finally, there are a range of SBA programs targeted at our veterans, most notably the Veterans Business Outreach Centers, which serve over 60,000 clients each year. Uh, the VBOC pro program, along with Boots to, to Business and other veteran-oriented initiatives, ensure that our service members have the tools they need to go into business for themselves. There are currently 20 VBOCs responsible for ensuring veterans access to capital through marketing and outreach efforts. Most importantly, they promote veterans for federal procurement opportunities to ensure 3% of federal prime contracts and subcontracts go to service-disabled, veteran-owned small businesses. The SBA programs are key to helping business owners remain competitive in a global market. It's critical that we consider ways to legislatively strengthen SBA entrepreneurial development programs. Uh, we do so with our local communities in mind. Today's hearing will focus on the efforts with, within each of the SBA programs regarding community outreach. It's all, it also gives members a chance to hear about the challenges they face in developing their networks and assisting local small businesses uh, adapt to a rapidly changing economy. I look forward to the witnesses' insight, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I uh, thank the gentlelady. I, I also want to recognize our full committee chair, Chairman Shabbat, is here uh, and, and at the hearing. And I also just want to thank uh, our ranking member, Miss Adams. She is such a joy, and this is such a great committee to be on. She is a joy to work with, both in committee and outside of committee, on legislation that we work together on. And uh, I just think that's quite an honor to be on a committee where there's still uh, we, we still like each other in some of these jobs. So I just want to thank our ranking member. Um, and to the committee, uh, or to the, to the panel today, if committee members have an opening statement prepared, uh, I ask that they be submitted for the record. I'd like to take a moment to explain the timing lights for you. You each have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light will start out green. Uh, when you have one minute remaining, it will go to yellow, and when it turns red, your time's up. Now, I'll give you a little bit of time, but you got to remember, i got a little military in me, so I may tap you out, so don't get on. So try to adhere to the time limit as much as you can, but if you go a little over, we'll be understanding. And with that, our, fir our first witness is Mr. Era Bagdasarian. 
Mr. Bagdasarian is the CEO and co-founder of the OmniLart, uh, OmniLart, an emergency alert and notification systems company. In 2011, he authored the book, The Lemonade Stand, and Why to, a Why to book for entrepreneurs that later led to his founding of the Lemonhead Council. The Lemonhead Council serves as an advisory board of entrepreneurs helping entrepreneurs. Mr. Bagdasarian is an active member of his community, serving on the board of a number of organizations, including the George Mason University Enterprise Center and the United Way of the National Capital Area. He is testifying on behalf of America's SBDC, the association that represents America's nationwide network of small business development center. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Bagdasarian. I now yield to, Chair to Chairman Steve Chabot, uh, Chairman of the full committee, to introduce our next witness. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, Derek Brazil, who is the uh, co-founder and managing director of Mortar Cincinnati uh, Business Accelerator in my district uh, in, in Cincinnati. Um, the mission of Mortar is to, quote, enable underserved entrepreneurs and businesses to succeed, creating opportunities to build communities through entrepreneurship, unquote. Um, and uh, they they really do provide and, and fight for that mission uh, on a daily basis. Mr. Brazil and his many talented colleagues uh, have created an outstanding organization which continues to assist in bringing economic growth and opportunity uh, to many of Cincinnati's neighborhoods. Prior to his time at Mortar, Mr. Brazil worked as the director of civic projects at Lewis and Clark Company and the project manager at Strive Together. He also co-founded uh, Dreamopolis, uh, an entrepreneurial development nonprofit located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, he's testifying on behalf of SCORE, the nation's largest network of volunteer expert business uh, mentors with more than 10,000 volunteers in 300 chapters across the country. Uh, we thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brazil, for being here today and look forward to visiting uh, uh, you all in the past, both there uh, and here in Washington, and we're looking forward uh, to your testimony. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our next witness is Ms. Stephanie Carter. Ms. Carter is the president of SCB Management Consulting, Inc., a public and private sector financial and operations strategy and implementation consultation practice. SCB Management Consulting is also certified as both a women's business enterprise and a women-owned small business. Ms. Carter brings 25 years of experience to her current role, having previously worked at companies such as PricewaterhouseCooper, Cigna, and Resources Global Professionals. She is testifying on behalf of the Association of Women's Business Centers, which works to secure entrepreneurial opportunities for women by supporting and sustaining a national network of over 100 women's business centers. Thank you for being here, Ms. Carter. I now yield to Ms. Adams to introduce the final witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Tamara, is that Ta Tamara Bryant, uh, the Director for Veterans Business Outreach Center at Fayetteville State University in my home state. Uh, Ms. Bryant previously owned and operated a trucking company while also holding a position as Director of the Small Business Center at Fayetteville Community College. Under her leadership, uh, FTCC's Small Business Center was recognized with the Small B Business Center Excellence Award for Innovation in Programs and Services in 2013 and in 2015. During those years, she also served the, st as the, served the state director of the year award. Uh, and in 2017, under Ms. Bryant's leadership, FTCC received a national award from the National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship for College of Excellence. Ms. Bryant earned her degree from Fayetteville State University, she's a Bronco, and her master's degree from Central uh, Michigan University. Welcome, Ms. Bryant. Thank you for being here. Thank you again to our ranking member, uh, Ms. Adams. And with that, uh, Mr. Bagdasarian, you are recognized for five minutes to deliver your statement. You may begin. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking the Congressional Small Business Committee for inviting me to testify today on behalf of America's Small Business Development Centers to share a few of my thoughts on the impact of community support for entrepreneurial development. As a serial entrepreneur who founded his first enterprise before the age of 10, I believe that the opportunities for small businesses to innovate on a local, national, even global scale have never been better than they are today. 
I say this not just because I'm an unyielding optimist, but because I cannot think of a time in the whole of human history when such a wealth of resources and technologies were so readily available to anyone with a will and that most precious resource of all, an idea. I'm the co-founder and chief executive officer of OmniLert, the world's first emergency notification system for colleges and university campuses. Though our customer base has since expanded to include private enterprise, government, and nonprofits from all across the country. As a company founder, I have developed a keen appreciation for the obstacles and challenges one must endure when embarking upon such a venture. In fact, a few years back, I took it uh, to task to distill my experiences into a book entitled The Lemonade Stand, which I co-authored. The, le the Lemonade Stand is simply put the Y2 book on entrepreneurship, a memoir based on my own real-world experiences, revelations, successes, and of course, failures. I've also served as a chairman of the Town of Leesburg, Virginia's Economic Development Commission, a post that I had for, held for seven years, and I'm on numerous local and regional advisory boards whose purpose are to advocate for entrepreneurship. It is from this vantage point that I have seen the positive returns that result when a community invests in and supports entrepreneurial development. That's why I was stumped when 10 years ago I was asked for a Town of Leesburg marketing campaign why the town would be a good destination for entrepreneurs. I'm embarrassed to admit that I could not think of a single reason other than the fact that our town was a quaint, idyllic community. We had all the standard small business resources, a small business development center, SCORE, a chamber of commerce. However, we did not have a community that was systematically supportive of local entrepreneurship. This realization led to a concerted effort on my part and that of many others to start building the infrastructure for an entrepreneurship ecosystem a shared effort between community partners, both private and public, that was assembled program by program. The fruits of this effort, I believe, have yielded a model that can be replicated in large and small communities all across America. It is through this model and others like it that communities suffering from high unemployment or the uprooting of key industry can plant the seeds of entrepreneurship and cultivate the growth of new businesses through the proper education and a supportive local infrastructure. Much like a civic infrastructure, such as highways or the power grid, communities can build and develop infrastructure to harness great ideas that solve problems to power the economy. We have taken significant steps in Loudoun County, Virginia to build this ecosystem. And the three core aspects of this infrastructure are entrepreneurship education. Uh, this means learning how to view problems as opportunities, knowing how to develop an idea to something real and tangible, and learning how to fail and how to learn from failure to build a worldview that embraces challenges. Secondly, resources, a network of systems and programs to support the planning, creation, launch, and operations of a new venture. And thirdly, community, which is developed by proactively creating opportunities to connect and discover synergies with one another through events, engagements, and other programs designed exclusively for founders and supporters. My written testimony outlines some of these key programs that we have implemented for each of these uh, components. I believe that building the infrastructure to support the development of entre entrepreneurship is well within the means of every community in America, be it large or small. But the decision to go boldly forward is often too hindered by a fear of change or a desire to hang on the industries and ways of the past. Ironically, it was by embracing change that the great American industries of the past and present even came to exist. But in a world that the only constant is change itself, I believe that Congress has a purview and responsibility to provide the incentives and support that will help the American entrepreneurs continue to lead the world in innovation and industry. That's why I believe it should advocate for the building for infrastructure for entrepreneurship through champion, championing entrepreneurship education, support programs, and community engagement. Once this framework is built, an entrepreneurial ecosystem will develop and flourish incrementally, but this must be a deliberate effort requiring the participation of current entrepreneurs, businesses, community and education leaders, as well as public sector cooperation, advocacy, and resources. Of course, what works in Leesburg, Virginia may not work in Oxford, Mississippi, or Charlotte, North Carolina. Every community has its own unique strengths and assets. But the ideas I've been grateful to present in my testimony amount to a framework of sorts for communities to empower its most resourceful and motivated to be a catalyst for power positive economic and community change. There are thousands of communities around the world filled with smart, passionate and individuals with brilliant ideas. 
We can all advocate for an initiative to develop entrepreneurship in America, and it all starts with the local community level. I thank the chairman and subcommittee members for the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bagdasarian, and I now recognize Mr. Brazil for five minutes. Chairman Chabot, subcommittee Chairman Kelly, ranking member Adams, members of the subcommittee and members of the full committee, thank you for inviting me today and for the opportunity to offer testimony on the work of Mortar and more specifically, the value of our partnership with SCORE. Today, I would like to share why I believe that Mortar and our partnership with SCORE a national nonprofit that mentors aspiring and existing entrepreneurs represents our best chance for everyone, regardless of background, to achieve full participation in the American dream. Founded in 2014, Mortar works to create diverse communities by enabling historically marginalized entrepreneurs to access the resources needed to start and run successful businesses. Utilizing non-traditional methods, we take risks on an entrepreneur's abilities to start and grow businesses where others may not, providing an unparalleled connection to technical assistance, pop-up retail spaces to test ideas, and flexible friends and family styled microloans to grow businesses. Our Business Academy, for example, which works with mostly low-income African-American entrepreneurs, has a 96% graduation rate and is considered a, mod a model program across the country. We exist because we believe that there are minority men and women all across our country, especially in our inner cities, with an undeniable amount of world-changing talent. People like my father, Dennis, who through athletic potential was adopted by his white high school football coach, giving him the opportunity to become the first person in his family to graduate from college, to become a published author and father of three amazing kids. One of them, my twin brother named Desmond Brazil, is serving our country as a captain in the United States Army. Another example is Mortar graduate Means Cameron. Last Friday, I met with Means, the owner of one of America's hottest clothing brands, Black Owned, and his score counselor, Jim Staley. And if you're nice to me, I promise to bring you all a t-shirt. Um, they were meeting with me because Means, despite being college educated and the founder of a successful, hip streetwear company, needed access to capital to grow his business. To see Jim, a white, seasoned business executive, working with Means, an African-American millennial entrepreneur from the inner city, seamlessly working through a sophisticated business plan brought tears to my eyes. Jim's experience, coupled with Means' resourcefulness and Mortar's resources, will help Means continue to succeed. The reality is that many people like Means will never have an opportunity for their dreams to be realized without support from organizations like Mortar and SCORE. Our partnership with SCORE has helped Mortar graduates to exceed national business averages. For example, we know that of the 170 graduates of Mortar's program, 132 are still in business, with 71% engaged in our alumni support network. We estimate that in the past year alone, our, our entrepreneurs have added $1 million to our regional economy. One graduate, Brian Jackson, is on pace to open Cincinnati's first black-owned brewery. The work of Mortar is just getting started. We recognize that by partnering with organizations like SCORE, great things can happen. In four short years, we've worked together to offer 13 of our accelerated courses in five Cincinnati communities, and every graduate has received a mentor from SCORE. We've opened three additional pop-up spaces, and SCORE continues to help us evaluate the feasibility of future expansion opportunities. In addition, we're piloting our framework in Milwaukee, testing our approach to community and economic development for the first time outside of Cincinnati. We recognize the power in bringing together people of different backgrounds around a common, shared passion for entrepreneurship. As a result, we have forged lifetime bonds between people who may have never met otherwise. Moving forward, our plan is to continue partnering with SCORE, working to teach entrepreneurship in communities where the next Steve Jobs, Kanye West, or Walt Disney may live. We see a country where there is a mortar in every inner city corner, where the crazy dreamers who see the world differently will be encouraged, inspired, and, tra and trained to change the world. Thank you again for your time and for allowing me to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. 
thank you, Mr. Brazil, and thank your twin brother for his service to this great nation. Uh, I'm always impressed with those who choose to do that. Uh, Ms. Carter, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Kelly, Ranking Member Adams, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to share this testimony with you. My name is Stephanie Carter, and I am founder and president of SCB Management Consulting, whose core services are program and project management, risk management, strategic planning, and business process improvement as a subcontractor for the federal government and private sector organizations. I am testifying today on behalf of the Association of Women Business Centers, which supports the national network of 107 WBCs throughout the United States. As you know, the WBC program is a public-private partnership with 30 years of success in providing training, counseling, mentoring, and access to capital to women entrepreneurs across the country, women in businesses like me and SCB. Today's hearing is a needed discussion. Too often, we do not fully recognize the factors at the periphery of traditional business creation, despite their importance. I believe that the community fostered by WBCs is playing a key role in my success, and its replication can only mean good things for women entrepreneurs nationwide. Business success is predicated on a host of factors, ranging from the expertise of the business owner to wisdom of the business plan to the ability to access capital to picking the right location or marketing to hiring the right staff. What is undeniable, however, is that those businesses that have a network of support behind them fare better than those without. In my view, here are a few reasons why. First, a network allows you to problem solve the early crises of launching and growing a business. Along the way, whether it's incorporation or tax questions to the logistics of office space or your first hire, there are a myriad challenges in every business. When you have a network of fellow entrepreneurs, you can collectively solve and even anticipate many of these issues. Second, a strong community helps identify new opportunities. Every business, whether five minutes or five generations old, is seeking new opportunities. A community that understands your business and its offerings is incredibly helpful in spotlighting business development. Similarly, it also allows for teaming of entrepreneurs who may collectively offer an innovative solution to the market that individually is not available. Finally, and perhaps the hardest to define, but also the most important, a community and network gives you the confidence to become an entrepreneur and the persistence to thrive after that business is created. All three of these were true for my business. I launched SCB after ne nearly 20 years in corporate consulting and internal leadership roles. While I had the business, finance, and operations foundation of my Duke MBA in corporate roles, there were many aspects of entrepreneurship that I felt I needed, including legal, tax, sales, and marketing. I initially enrolled in entrepreneur and business planning courses with the Women's Business Development Center in Center City, Philadelphia in early 2016. Once I was in the Washington, D.C. area and with the public sector being one of the greatest opportunities for consulting, I embarked on learning as much as I could. I took my first seminar with the WBC in July 2017. During that session, I learned about other WBC courses, including the procurement series offered by Prince George's County and Montgomery County. I started that six-part series in August 2017 because it offered a host of information about accessing the public sector market. The series culminated with a matchmaking session with procurement specialists in November. I enrolled in the procurement series for the business development information. However, I gained so many relationships that ultimately formed a community of support for my business. The WPC counselor who facilitated this series has become a great ongoing resource for business development opportunities as well as other information. I forged a partnership with one of the speakers who noticed me during my elevator pitch that we may have some synergies and currently are pursuing business development opportunities together. I include one of the procurement series participants who is just starting her consulting business in a recent bit of mine. Public sector panelists have been very accessible and helpful in gaining a greater understanding of their respective organizations. It also is not just the network at the WBCs alone that has provided benefit. I learned of other networks at the WBC that I should engage and have expanded my ability to grow my business through them. I learned through the WBC courses that an effective market penetrator for new entrepreneurs such as myself are women and minority certification. As a new cer cer newly certified WBE and MBE, I regularly attend informational and matchmaking sessions offered by the certifying agencies. I attend a variety of 
forums, including those by the state of Maryland, Ready, Set, Grow monthly informational sessions offered by the governor's office that also offered the opportunity to meet industry leaders. As a result, I have begun to forge new relationships in the public sector. One of the first questions I often receive in these networks is, where do you live? People are consistently shocked that I have traveled from Calvert County, which is in Southern Maryland, to Baltimore, Columbia, Northern Virginia, et cetera, to attend an event. However, opportunities for the information and access that I need generally are not offered in Southern Maryland. My example is not unique. Companies hover around these networks and we do, must do a better job of creating communities of support in areas that need business growth the most. Similarly, we must continue to enhance the WBC program at SBA. With jurisdiction over the program, this committee has the opportunity to make the benefits I have experienced more widespread. The limitations of an outdated authorization are evident in the day-to-day -day experiences of these centers. I encourage policymakers to consider legislation that will allow for more flexibility for WBCs, particularly eliminating the many burdens that they face and choose not to operate in certain areas. The role of AWBC, who I am representing here today, should also be leveraged. Through statute, we should build on the best practices of other resource partners and allow for accreditation. Part of this process would ensure that every WBC has the skilled resources to, to develop communities of support for women business owners. Finally, Congress should increase the visibility of the WBC program. I encourage these, this committee to use its extensive media abilities to talk about WBCs. The more we do that, the larger the community of support becomes. With the help of Congress, the SBA, and the WBC, I believe we can continue to build a community of support that will allow women entrepreneurs and small business owners around the country to realize their full entrepreneurial potential and contribute significantly to economic growth and job creation. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Carter, and I now recognize Ms. Bryant for five minutes. Good morning. I would like to thank Ranking Member Alma Adams and Chairman Trent Kelly for the invitation to share with you the Veterans Business Outreach Center's programs and services. Again, my name is Tamira Bryant. I am the director of the Veterans Business Outreach Center at Fevel State University, serving the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Kentucky. The Veterans Business Outreach Center, also called VBA, is one of the Small Business Administration programs that provide business training, counseling, and SBA resource partner referrals to active duty service members, National Guard, and reserve personnel, veterans and military spouses interested in starting and growing small businesses. VBA Entrepreneurial Program Development Programs its collaborations of resources and partnerships are critical success factors for VBOC's mission, and it helps increase the success rate of veteran-owned businesses. VBOC is hosted at Fevel State University, College of Business and Economics, a historically black college university, and it is known for its support of military affiliate students through serving large numbers of active duty so soldiers, their spouses and families, as well as veterans. This collaboration with FSU is a natural fit for VBOX target customer. It's allow VBOX to op opportunity to collaborate and partner in the College of Business and Economics entrepreneurship programs, such as small business consulting teams. The small business consulting teams are undergraduate and graduate students. Many of the students are military affiliate, minorities, and women that work closely with our clients to solve business needs in areas of marketing research, feasibility studies, to name a few. These student engagement opportunities provide students with real world educational experience focused on helping small businesses, and our clients receive valuable assistance at no charge. FSU VBOT is extremely fortunate to have great partnerships with highly valued resource partners. We understand our clients come with a unique technical skill set, impeccable leadership skills, core values, and a mission-focused mindset, but oftentimes they may lack business acumen skills or the ability to transfer their military skills into an entrepreneurial career pathway. FSU VBOT client base is very diverse, serving over 400 clients this past physical year. 47% minority and 21% women with various needs. I would like to highlight one successful client for whom VBOT leveraged other resources that yield clients great results. Marcella Eubanks, Army veteran, 82nd Airborne, owner of Bravery's Kids Gym, came to VBOT with her idea of owning an all-inclusive children's gym. 
with a focus on children with special needs. She received assistance with developing her business plan and a startup assistance and referral to a local community bank to obtain SBA loan. She came back to the center for other services because she viewed the staff at VBOC as a trusted advisor and was willing to work with other agencies. She's been referred to the SBTDC for specialized training in QuickBooks and utilized the College of Business and Economics student internships. These referrals have helped her hire six part-time employees and win pitch competitions, improve business operations and marketing systems. This is one of many success stories demonstrating FSU VBOX collaboration with resource partners and local organizations to deliver desirable outcomes for our clients. Veteran-owned businesses are the pillars to the American economy. Nearly one in 10 businesses are veteran-owned. Veteran women-owned businesses steadily increase each year. 15% businesses are owned by veteran women. The past physical year for VBOT Network was marked by very significant levels of outreach, training, and services for veteran-owned and military spouses' small businesses. Over 1,700 training events were held, 178 businesses created, and 1,006 jobs created and retained, 243 prime and subcontracts awarded, and $8.5 million in SBA loans approved. Most of VBOT centers cover multiple states and attend Boost to Business courses, all with a budget of $6 million. The 22 Veteran Business Outreach Centers, through its cooperative agreement, is committed to ensuring that every service member and military spouses have the resources they need in their communities to start and operate small businesses, achieve post-secondary career success, and strengthen the nation's economy. My ask to you is to continue to support of VBOX services to increase the success rate of this highly skilled workforce. Again, thank you for this opportunity to share and represent the VBOX program, a program that helps our service men and women and veterans who fought protect and serve this great nation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bryant. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, first of all, Ms. Bryant, I just want to comment. I'm a huge supporter of the VBOC. We have one at Mississippi State University, and they do such a great job with both our veterans and communities and making sure that we have those small businesses that are veteran owned Because we know we have what's in their heart. We just got to make sure they have uh, the, the right tools, and I really appreciate our VBOC for doing that. And Ms. Carter, your testimony mentions a great deal about networking opportunities within a women's business center, WBC. What role does community networking play in encouraging small business creation? Well, it has provided a tremendous opportunity. So um, the example I gave um, where a speaker actually did outreach, but they also encouraged us while we're in those sessions to think about teaming with each other. Right, so we're not competitors. We might be, have many synergies. And so that's exactly what I did. So I was able to do that recently on a bid who met a woman who had um, similar experience to me. We might be competitors one day, but right now we're partnering together. You know, I'm a, a, an old business guy. I've been out so long, I don't even remember what it is. But, you know, I know you, only, you, don't, you never have one store in a mall. You have four anchor stores because even though you're competitors, you also share a lot and you generate. So I really appreciate your comments on that, and I'm proud of what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, Mr. Brazil, you discussed the success of the partnership between SCORE and Mortar in your testimony. How does this partnership harness the existing knowledge within the community to enable small business success? I would say that um, the folks that SCORE are able to offer for our entrepreneurs are invaluable because they bring with them, in many times, decades of business experience that our entrepreneurs would never have access to without having that relationship with SCORE. Um, I would say that the value of a su successful business person is the network that they have. And SCORE brings not just a network of uh, other coaches, but their own personal networks. Our SCORE coaches have provided so many connections just from that initial interaction. So for us, uh, there is a value in resource exchange that SCORE offers, but it's also the networks that SCORE is able to offer for the entrepreneurs that we're working with. 
and once again, I mean, it, it's so important to know where the resources and the things that you need to do that. But it's also important for people to believe in you right. and to know. As, as my daddy used to tell me when I was a, a kid, he said, uh, you know, we're often scared to do things because we're scared of being told no or failing. And my daddy always said, you start at no, and if you don't do anything, you stay there. So I, I think all of these organizations do that. I think they help people get off no and to do things and to have as least chance possible of failing, but they encourage them to reach out and chase their ideas. Mr. Bagdasarian, your testimony refers to the need for strong community to support small business growth and creation. What role do small businesses play in creating strong communities? It plays a very important role because I believe that it, it takes entrepreneurs to create more entrepreneurs, to encourage, as you, as you mentioned, to provide the resources, connecting the experiences of experienced entrepreneurs, the, some of the challenges that they, they face because the reality is most startups, most new businesses will fail. It will fail many times. I know with my personal experience prior to starting OmniAlert, I had three or four businesses that didn't, never took off. And so knowing that, having the confidence to go back and, and the resilience to go back and try again, try again because something will, will fit. If you're solving a problem that's not being met in the community, there's an opportunity there. And it's important also, I think the, there's, a, there's a cultural factor, right? The cult, building a culture that you can do it. It can be done uh, versus simply, you know, find a good job, but you can do this. And that's, that's probably the biggest obstacle to, to taking that first step to starting a business. Thank you. Ms. Bryant, uh, given the limited number of VBOX, how do you work with other entrepreneurial development resource partners to ensure that returning veterans find a supportive community? Sorry, Your Honor. The support that we have in North Carolina has been tremendous and critical. We've been fortunate to have um, entrepreneurial development programs such as SCORE, such as the Women's Business Center and SBTDC um, in that area. We're also fortunate in North Carolina to have another um, state government um, program called the Small Business Centers of North Carolina. And so collaboratively together, we're able to assist um, veterans, military spouses, and starting and growing small businesses by working together with different developmental programs and getting access to loans and procurement opportunities. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time, and I now recognize our ranking member, Ms. Adams, for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony. Uh, beyond SBA's uh, business assistance services, there are a number of training opportunities and resources available to veteran-owned small businesses, such as our, our partnerships between uh, VBOX and college campuses. Uh, uh, Ms. Bryant, uh, can you explain how effective educational classes can be for entrepreneurs and, and whether they are an efficient way to supplement um, other training programs? Thank you, Congressman, for that um, question. Yes, uh, another example I would say is the one course that is offered like at Fellow State University is called our Small Business Management course. Um, with this course, it teaches business concepts and strategies and principles on how to operate a, a, a successful small business. A lot of times you have minorities and women that are in those, in those classes. Those classes also are required that they work with a, a local entrepreneur to assist them with that business um, need that they have. This allows that student to be exposed to real world examples and be able to apply the knowledge that they learn in the classroom to a real world example of helping that small businesses. Um, so that's an example that I would give in terms of how class and how class and real world can come together to help small businesses as well as the student gain that particular skill set to be able to get the job. Great. Thank you very much. I am a strong advocate of HBCU. Started the first bipartisan HBCU caucus here, which I co-chair with um, uh, Congressman Bradley Byrne from Alabama, graduate twice of uh, North Carolina A&T State University, 40 years on the campus of Bennett College. But given your position uh, on an HBCU campus, how important is it um, uh, to coordinate uh, the coordination between government, private industry, educational institutions, and nonprofits in advancing the position of entrepreneurs? And wh where can Congress uh, better support your efforts? I would say to continue to provide um, access to affordable and accessible education for these students. A lot of times these are minorities and women and first generational 
children that's looking to obtain a degree. Um, having these programs in place will allow them and expose them to opportunities that they would not have before. So that having that access to affordable education will assist not only those students, but it also assists the small businesses where they have a highly skill set to be able to continue to grow and sustain their business. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brazil, um, could you uh, please describe the efforts made to recruit volunteers from uh, different backgrounds and how that has impacted the business ownership in your community? Yes, I would say um, first and foremost, SCORE has stepped to the plate and provided uh, a the lion's share of the volunteering for um, the entrepreneurs who are going through our program, and that's been an amazing partnership for our organization. I would also say that from that experience, many other people who may have maybe been uh, nervous or anxious about working with our entrepreneurs have stepped forward uh, to sometimes even double up um, to volunteer and provide business support for Mortar graduates. I would say in a lot of ways, the Mortar program and our partnership with SCORE has become an example uh, to our community on how race relations can continue to improve. We have mostly, again, low-income African Americans and SCORE uh, sometimes can be a little seasoned and white. Um, but our folks are coming together around a shared common objective and the partnership is amazing. We do these surveys at the end of every class and five is a perfect score from a satisfaction perspective and no survey has gone under 4.6 out of five. So that initial relationship with score around business coaching has been amazing. And I said, I'd say there's a multiplier effect that now we're seeing uh, someone from our board who's an African-American male, he has now joined SCORE's core volunteers and he is now uh, providing business support for other uh, not just graduates of Mortar's program, but other participants who go through SCORE. So I would say that um, Mortar has provided this great example of what's possible, and we're seeing a lot of growth from our volunteers. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I've got 38 seconds, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bagdasarian. Uh, what what some of the obstacles you need to start up? If you can maybe give me one. Fear. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Fear. It, fear is probably the greatest obstacle. Um, not knowing what needs to be done. I, I have worked with, with hundreds of entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs over the years, and the greatest obstacle is the expectation that I need to write a 500-page business plan and then go out and raise $15 million of seed capital <laughs> and then go get a big office, just knowing how to take that first step. And like I mentioned, there's never been a better time to start a business now because there's so many resources that are available today that did not exist 20 years ago. Great. Right on time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Time the gentle, gentle lady yields back. I now recognize Dr. Marshall from Kansas for five minutes of questions. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. First question would be, uh, to cut and continue, what are the biggest barriers to market, to, to in, enter the market, and then cut, what's the biggest reasons for lack of long-term success? So barriers to entering the market, to start a small business, and then barriers to keep you from, from being successful. And maybe just spend 15 or 20 seconds with each of one of you, two or three, one of the top yet. Maybe start with Ms. Bryan on the far end, and we'll come back. Some of the barriers that I see um, a lot of small businesses face is access to capital. Um, a lot of times not knowing what that financial literacy is and what it takes to obtain that capital. Um, another barrier is not understanding um, some of the small business skill sets that it takes, especially in our veteran population. They understand and know what what it's like being in the military, but translating that into an uh, and translating that military skill set into an entrepreneurial pathway and understanding those business um, skills of marketing and sales and having that technical assistance to be able to help them navigate that system. Ms. Carter, anything to add? Uh, yes, um, as I mentioned during my testimony, there there are probably many barriers. The the ones that come to mind particularly are some skills that you currently don't have, and what's most important is building your um, your business, is sales and marketing. So the technical skills that I've been able to gain through the WBC, as well as I've taken um, sessions with SCORE and SBDC, have been extremely helpful. The other is access to capital. So one of the things that I continually fall into is, um, you know, when I when I bid on something, do I have the staff? Well, I can't hire the staff until I have the contracts. So it's this cycle until someone, you know, kind of gives me the opportunity okay. and I'm able to do that. Okay. 
I would briefly add unconscious bias. I think a lot of times we expect for successful entrepreneurs to look a certain way, to speak a certain way, to behave a certain way, but a lot of times there are entrepreneurs who are out there who may not understand social norms. So maybe they use slang or maybe they have misspellings in their business plans. And despite all those things, they still have a valuable idea and if given an opportunity and some access to capital, they could be successful. But until we're able to dismantle some of the biases we have around successful entrepreneurship, uh, those folks will continue to be left behind. Okay. Just the, the only thing I would have to add is um, <clears throat> knowing, uh, understanding the product market fit and understanding that the first idea, the first business that you might take to market, the initial market may not be the market that you ultimately pursue that has the greatest growth. But having the right mentors, having the right ad advice resources, having that community that provides that support may provide you with that insight on which direction to take. And that, that happens all too often. Okay. Surprised nobody said the cost of health care. I think the cost of health care would be one of the biggest barriers for someone to leave a job and start a new business. Uh, let's talk about the tax cuts and, and jobs bill. Has, has the tax cuts and jobs bills, is it impacting any of your businesses? Do you see it going forward impacting it? Maybe we'll start here and go back that way. Uh, has not directly impacted uh, my business. Um, if, if there was a, if we were required to um, uh, distribute funds to, towards headcount, for example, that may be more of an incentive to hire people, reinvest that, biz that funds back into the business. Uh, but it has not made a direct impact into, into my specific business. Are you a, a C Corps, an LLC, or an S Corps? We're an LLC. And you don't think lowering the LLC tax is going to help you any? Yeah, well, it certainly helps. Uh, but as far as, as far as driving new job growth, I don't think it's directly tied to creating new jobs. I think that it certainly helps from a, from a, a business owner perspective. Okay. I could go into more depth later. I would briefly add that I think our folks are so far behind that it hasn't directly affected them yet. So, so uh, decreasing their taxes, giving them $2,000 more, the average salary in their own pockets, not impacting them in any way? Uh, in the conversations that I've had with our graduates, they have not uh, communicated that that has been a benefit for them. So it's possible, but I have not had those direct conversations yet. Okay. Carter? Um, because I'm so small, I think it may make an incremental difference, but not a significant at this point in my stage of my business. Okay, Ms. Bryant? We have had some businesses that have said that the, the Bills that have helped and some that said it has not. In regards to have helped, it does help them in regards to being able to um, put more funds to their business, if that be via being able to purchase ad additional equipment or hire a new personnel. Yeah, I've talked to tens, maybe hundreds of companies that are making capital purchases because they can write it all off. Uh, talked to an accountant where 96 out of 100 of his clients in a small rural Kansas community are seeing significant uh, tax benefits in their own pocket as well. And this American consumer is what drives this economy. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize um, Mr. Norman from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, each, each, each one of you for taking your time out today. Regulations. I know uh, I'm a small business owner. What regulation would you cut if you had the opportunity and uh, address the workforce? I'm having trouble with, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Brazil, people coming to work. They've either never worked before or they don't have the basic skill set to interact with people. How do we address that? And we'll start with Mr. Bagusarian. Well, typically the, the regulations that my business encounters are really industry specific, specifically with telecommunications, uh, because we work with, with cellular providers and um, they're really specific to, to that. So in the context of this discussion, um, I really don't have any specifics to share with you. I would say uh, the JOBS Act has been a great start to um, open the flow of capital for entrepreneurs, but I would say that again, um, what we're looking for from the threshold to have people even able to access those initial resources can be very challenging uh, for people that are coming from a different culture. Uh, I would also argue that even though somebody may not uh, speak or behave based upon uh, traditional social norms, they still, in my opinion, could run successful businesses. I like to often give this example of when I go to my local Kroger down the street, I get asked all the time if I want to ride. And in my opinion, that same idea could have been translated into an Uber. It's ride sharing. However, 
there's not the access to, to, to technology or capital or whatever it might be to start that kind of a business. So I would say that if we can do more to unlock the flow of capital for those kinds of entrepreneurs, the better. Let me ask you, follow up with this. Now, how would you do that? How, how I mean, when you go for a loan at a bank, you've got to have, uh, they have shareholders too. How do you, how would you say do that? I mean. Sure, I would say, let's say you're my uncle, which would be, would be an honor. Uh, and it was Thanksgiving and I said, uh, could you loan me $500? I doubt that you would ask me for my credit score, for a collateral, or for some of these other things, because you know me and you know my track record, you would hopefully give me a loan. I think the same thing could apply to how we offer access to capital for disadvantaged entrepreneurs, just to give them a leg up. Maybe it's lower amounts of capital, but we can lower uh, collateral, interest rates, et cetera, to, to still give them an opportunity to at least test their business ideas. Um, with respect to the workforce, um, I think as a small business owner, we have tremendous opportunities when we can. So I actually just recently formed a nonprofit organization called the Vendor Community Partnership to try to address the crime in, in um, downtown Baltimore. And there's a, there's a tremendous problem with joblessness. I believe it starts with education and opportunities. So the nonprofit um, has formed a partnership um, with the Downtown Partnership of Baltimore and those large businesses, we created a vendor, um, preferred vendor list of small businesses. Those small businesses get on the list if they hire at least one person from these underserved communities. We're partnering with some nonprofits who will help with the job training, preparing you know, many people who want to work but just haven't had the opportunity. So they'll be prepared to work, they'll show up every day, and they'll be productive citizens. And we believe that that's also going to you know, impact, you know, have a, a, a positive impact on the crime and overall allow people to contribute to their families. In regards to the lack of the workforce as well, I agree. I think we need to continue to work with the local high schools, the community colleges, the universities, and collaborate with the business industries and to find out what are those skill sets that they're looking for. Continue to implement more programs in the high schools and community college with the 21st century skills that's lacking from interpersonal skills, those things that um, that's, that's lacking in the workforce, to be able to assist them and help those small businesses obtain and retain those, 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 high, um, those students. I think education and exposure is the key to be able to, to retract and recruit and train highly skilled employees. Yeah, and I think y'all in your role when you go into these schools, high schools particularly, you ought to, we, we ought to stress we have customers to please now. There's a sense of not understanding that you've got a boss. You've got customers you have to sell your product to, and there's a certain uh, responsibility that comes with that. Uh, thank you all. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I just want to thank all four uh, panel members. You know, one thing you didn't mention, and Mr. Brazil, you kind of hit on it, is uh, role models are so important to see successful people. And I look at the panel that I got sitting in front of me, and I know all, as Chairman Shabbat likes to say, all 30 people watching C-SPAN right now uh, can see. But, you know, it, it's important. Each of you represent role models that people can look up to, and they believe they can do it right. And I, and I, and I go back to believing you can succeed is the very first step and all those other things before they can even fall into place. And I... Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. The community small business relationship is a vital factor in not only the success of the individual community and small businesses, but also in the growth of the United States economy overall. I would particularly like to thank our witnesses. Uh, I, I do want to mention Congressman Velasco as the ranking member is coming. Uh, I'm already in the middle of closing. I'm going to close, but I hope y'all will stay around and talk to her. She is quite a phenomenal team player on this committee, and uh, and and I've kind of get to another committee, and I know Miss Adams does too. But uh, I do ask that you stay around and please uh, take the opportunity to talk to her because she is a phenomenal member of this committee. Uh, I would particularly like to thank our witnesses for their testimony. I appreciate each of your insights into this relationship and what Congress can do to further foster this relationship going forward. Now I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection so ordered, we're adjourned. <laughs>